Welcome viewers to the very first It Depends podcast of 2023. Jumak Degani set the data world on fire when she published her data mesh approach to building decentralized data applications in 2018. A few days ago, on January 18, 2023, she announced her company called Next Data with the sole aim of fulfilling the promise of data mesh and building decentralized applications. Many of us kind of expected this to happen, so here we are. I am honored to have Jamak with us today to discuss all things Next Data. Jamak, welcome to the podcast. Thank you so much for having me. It's I'm delighted to be here. Thank you. Although you don't need an introduction, your LinkedIn post from just three days ago has some 200,000 impressions. I'm sure our listeners are keen to hear about your background. So can you please take it away? Sure, a short introduction. I'm a technologist at heart. Uh, I I guess I, I was born in Iran. I was raised in Australia. I live in US in the Bay Area. I, um, I guess I did software engineering. I studied software engineering and management and worked in the tech industry for 20, 20 something years now, 24, 25 years now. Uh, my background is has always been in distributed systems and large scale kind of either networking um, layer problems or now distributed systems, um, transactional systems and now data systems, I suppose that's uh, very close to my heart. I worked at ThoughtWorks for 10 years as a consultant uh, on the ground, executing large scale problems, which gave me the purview of real world issues with uh, managing complexity and it coined the term data mesh and evangelized it for a few years, learned the challenges with implementing it. And now I am the CTO and founder of Next Data uh, to build the technology to bring this concept to life. Excellent. Really great to have you. Uh, this is so such an exciting start to the year. We all are super keen to hear about Next Data, but let's start first at the beginning. What was the problem you were trying to solve when you came out with the concept of data mesh? In other words, what's broken in the current approach? Sure. There was a mismatch between our aspirations, how we wanted to use data at scale, Mm -hmm. and our implementations and solutions to get there. And that mismatch was really uh, the root cause of that mismatch was this idea of centralization of the data that people that ultimately either generate the data or use the data are out of that conversation. And we created the middleman, the data teams, to mm -hmm. transfer and extract and transfer and model and centralize data so that we can get value from it. And that process, though, uh, very effective when you're smaller, very effective when uh, your need for data is isolated to business intelligence is fundamentally uh, broken where you want when you want to apply data at scale in almost in every application. It has a element of uh, organizational and technological bottleneck, uh, that centralization, centralized modeling, centralized ownership, centralized storage of the data. Uh, and uh, inherently doesn't build responsibility and trust in the system because the data goes through so many hands and so many pipelines. Um, and if something goes wrong, you really don't have a, an accountable team who's capable of uh, fixing that problem or knowing the data. So it, it was a very fragile um, and an effect, an effective system for getting value from data at scale for AI and um, analytics. So that was the root cause that data mesh attempted to solve. So, so you're saying there was like, because of this fragmented nature, the integration cost was high, um, developer experience, um, data ownership. So these were the problems you set out to solve? Absolutely. Fixing the data ownership problem, fixing the developer experience problem, building accountability, trust and responsibility into the system in a way that can be effectively implemented, uh, removing centralized synchronization points of governance and data ownership. So when you came up with this term data mesh, I'm just curious, how did you decide to call it a data mesh? And I'm asking this because I want to get one thing out of the way. There are people who have been who said that they originated this term. So what was your thinking to call it a data mesh? 
Absolutely. Um, so in fact, when the idea, uh, you know, was created and was being tested, I didn't have a name for it. Uh, my very first public talk on the topic at O'Reilly Conference in New York in uh, early 2019 uh, called this concept Beyond the Lake. Uh, mm -hmm. And in fact, at the end of the conference, I asked the audience, can you give me a name? I don't know what to name this uh, concept. All I can say is that Beyond Data Lake. Uh, and uh, at the time, I was very much also for the uh, few years before that, I was very engaged with implementation of service meshes, which were a similar concept, but in the operational systems and microservices world. Um, and I suppose I'm not just creative enough to come up with a very good name. So I just mixed data with service mesh and came up with the name data mesh. I'm pretty sure I Googled <laughs> for it I um, and I couldn't really find any, uh, I mean, there are references outside of, outside of our field, like in the networking and um, in fact, in uh, David Brin's Heaven Reach in 1999, his novel, he uses the term data mesh, but they were in a different namespace, they have different space than the data. So uh, I came, uh, I, I named it data mesh, and I'm sorry that it has created some um, conflict with name that might have been used in a in, in, in a place that I just couldn't find it, I suppose. So I, so I, I want to clarify that uh, on, on this podcast, because... Uh, I do want to recognize my dear friend, Mark Beyer. He's a Gartner visionary. He did, you know, mention data mesh in his writing, but but like most of Gartner content and intellectual properties behind the paywall. So it's not really available to the outside world. And so so I, I, uh, that's, I think, been some of the confusion, but it, there should be no confusion. So, and you said David Brin's uh, book called Heaven's Rich, mentioned it in 1999 so that's pretty amazing well, apologies david apologies mark if i you know i <laughs> the term that it, it it meant something else um but it's just the origin of it was really the bringing the concept and thinking of service mesh and microservices uh that solve the problem of um complexity by giving autonomy to teams and create this units of architecture that are right. reliable and self-contained and bring that to data so that was uh that was a really the, the thing the it. genesis of this whole That's idea so so talking about the the genesis and how you came up with this i remember when i first heard about data mesh there were three principles and then you added the fourth principle so what transpired Yes, absolutely. So then, uh, you know, with this, as I was publishing and writing and publicly talking about this, we, uh, I was working at ThoughtWorks, so we were on the ground implementing these concepts and trying it out with large scale clients that we had at the time. And I remember in every workshop that, you know, we often uh, start our executions with a lot of collaborative uh, discoveries and workshops and every workshop when I talk about data mission, Let's let's now apply it and let's see how the technology would look like. The people from governance team kind of raised their hands. And what about the governance? Like, where is the governance in this picture? And I had assumed the governance actually become embedded into every aspect. So, in fact, the governance was an attribute in the very first pub, uh, blog post that I put out. It was an attribute of the data product. It wasn't a separate pillar. Um, but because it's such a key component of every data strategy, data organization, uh, it had to have a presence. And in fact, when we think about when we try to solve a problem with, uh, you know, decomposing a problem to its fundamental pillars and elements, you need to have uh, pillars that are counter, um, I guess, balance each other out, right? They're, they're uh, counter forces, so you don't skew the system in one way. And in fact, the you know decentralization can can go so far in a way that nothing works with each other, right? There's no standardization, there's no globalization of standards. So this governance was necessary as a counterforce to that decentralization to create that dynamic equilibrium. If we think about system thinking, also um, you know we had to address how the governance was being done. Uh, but in this new model, hence uh, I use the term governance, but then I uh, put the you know attributes of that there has to be competition, it has to be federated to yeah. work with a decentralized system. Very nice. What do you feel is a roadmap of data mesh? You know how everything in our space 
gets evolved, the different versions. So where do you think data mesh is headed? Yeah, so I think, um, you know, as a concept, data mesh was the result of thinking really big, thinking far, but also thinking in simple first principles. Don't be too prescriptive in what the technology should be, what the approach should be. So think about first principles, think big. Uh, so I think the concept perhaps more or less is going to, to stay the way it is and Maybe the evolution of that would be a few years out. However, from the implementation perspective, the practices organizationally, architecture-wise, and technology to make it uh, a native experience, business as usual, I think that's where the next phase of evolution for data mesh is. And, um, and, and that's where I want to play next, is that how can we improve the practices and technology in particular uh, to absolutely make data mesh a table stake, to make data mesh a just business as usual. We don't have to talk about it anymore, more, and it disappears in the background. Oh, wow. So data mesh as a name disappears in the background. It, it's Is it something like, you know, we take a microservices architecture for granted with APIs? Is, is that your thinking? Absolutely. I mean, when we started with microservices again, I remember it was 2011, 2012, where the very first implementations of it came to exist. And it was such a, uh, you know, such, such an aspirational North Star for us to get to. And uh, we, it took us a few years to make it so easy that every new or old company is just how they build software. And, you, mm -hmm. you know, now most of the companies, we don't have to, really have a strategy around it or think about it too much because this, that's how we work. And then the technology has normalized uh, to make that um, a default mode of building applications. And I hope we get there with data mesh too. So um, talking about data mesh, the four principles, you talked about the federated computation governance is the fourth. So we've got domain driven, we've got data as a product, we've got self-service data infrastructure. So those are the first three. I am particularly interested in data products. I think data products, everything I'm doing these days has some data products around it. Your second principle is data as a product. What is the difference between data as a product and data products? Uh, data as a product was a principle of data mesh. And it's an approach to how we treat data. Um, and in fact, it was as a, again, as a counterbalancing force was uh, a necessity to make that decentralization of ownership of data work. Because if it didn't have data as a product, what could happen was that, okay, every domain owns its own data, but they're just using it for themselves. Like they have no motivation. Mm -hmm to share that with others. Data remains to be an asset and treated as one. And I don't share my assets with people usually so that we don't have no incentive to, to share it. So data as a product is really a convergence of product thinking and data usage and data sharing uh, to really treat data as something that we want to provide to the users, to the cons consumers of this product, to delight their experience. And in the in the book, I put eight characteristics around it uh, that make it every every data product should be discoverable, understandable, you know, natively used by a variety of data users, and so on and so on. So that's kind of what the data as a product um, meant to be. I see. So, so the data as a product uh, is a concept, and in your book, you've got eight characteristics like it has to be discoverable, uh, interoperable, like you said, understandable, secure. Uh, all those uh, you've defined, and data product is an implementation of that into something that you can consume. Yes. So I think that's the interesting part is that everybody loves this idea of a data as a product. Yeah. Um, and the manifestation of that, re implementation of that yeah. took many shapes and forms. Oh, wow. um, and if you look at the industry, even as technology vendors, there are data product catalogs and discovery tools and data product, you know, platforms and so on. And each of them have a different manifestations. So I think I, I had my own version that I thought, again, came from 
a, a, a mental model and a way of working that I had learned building distributed systems um, that in fact I'll call data quantum for a little while and it's just, it's just a manifestation, particular manifestation of the data as a product. Right. Um, and it's, we will see, we will see. I think uh, yeah, we will yeah. see what it turns out to be at the end. Yeah, so I, I'm hearing a lot about data products. What are you hearing? Like, do you see there's an adoption? Are people gravitating towards data products? I think so. It really resonated. In fact, uh, very early implementations of data mesh, we, we were very careful with our you know, clients, my clients at the time to not alienate people by use names that they just hadn't heard, like coming and saying like, all oh, right, we're going to do data mesh that here. People will just run away from the other end, right? But mm -hmm. we, what we did was without really using the term data mesh or so on, um, we introduced the basic concepts and basic principles and data as a product was the one that just everybody loved. In fact, it had, we heard that all the way up to the board, they were excited about this like new, you know, new frontier for the data teams to build and share data products. Mm -hmm. uh, so that's what I hear um, as well. Of course, I have a bias that data product is just a pillar of a much bigger change around decentralization. Uh, but in itself could be an incremental, I guess, improvement to whatever centralized even system that we have, right? Yeah. So, so you know, uh, earlier on we we were talking, and uh, you mentioned that data product is a superset of data mesh. And if, um, uh, it might have been a different conversation. So, data product as a superset. I think um, you're right. You're right. So, uh, data product as some adoption. So, people, you're right that a lot of people kind of got to know data mesh. And then they went, okay, out of all these pillars, oh, decentralization is really hard, giving ownership to the domains, federated governance. I have no idea even what that is, but I can make data as a, I can make my data a little bit better as a yeah. product. So a super, I guess you're right that uh, many companies that haven't even implemented data measure, um, yeah, they're adopting is. that product thinking to, to a degree. And again, as I said, that's, that's why it's perhaps a super set of, adopters that are adoption. yes that's great what skills are needed to adopt data mesh how, and how difficult are these skills to acquire yes yeah, so uh let's talk about a few of those because data mesh tries to break barriers and walls between disciplines and accountabilities that we had mm -hmm. it's reduce introducing new kind of hybrid roles, roles that need to bring two different disciplines together. Uh, as an example, we are removing the, the kind of the barrier between product and data, right? So we, we say that you have domain teams that are building products and they're building software uh, as a manifestation of those products. And now they're responsible for their data as a product. So uh, there is a new role around Kind of data product owner that data mesh introduces and that's a you know that's two people in one right people that understand data really well the business domain because they're domain focused they're not understanding data for the universe just for their domain so uh they understand their business really well they understand the, the, the digital representation of the facts in that business the data really well uh, and they know the function of product management and product ownership, so they can treat it as a product. They can, uh, you know, look at the metrics of a successful product, such as net promoter score and so on. So I think that product owner is a good example of a new role to be developed. Nice. Um, and your question around how hard it is, I think we have to look at where those people are today, what yeah. are they doing today and what skills they have and how hard it is to bridge that gap, to bring them to this new role. And often I see either you have people that were in the governance data stewardship that understood the data well, they're coming to the domain and learning about the product management or people who were in the product side, uh, understood the product and the business really well, and then they need to understand data. 
But at the end of the day, we want to really reduce the complexity of understanding and working with data in a way to reduce that um, gap between you know, where they are and uh, where they need to be. And that's part of that self-serve platform is to reduce that complexity. So I have this uh, Venn diagram that certainly flashed in my head where you got business data and product management. And at the intersection of that, is the skill that you need. Would that be accurate to say? Absolutely. Yes, yes. For the data product owner, for sure. Okay, uh, There's yes. also a data product developer, right? Is that another role you see? Yes. I I hope that Data Mesh doesn't end up introducing yet another fractional role. By fractional, I mean that someone who's not contributing to value directly. They're just the cog in the machine or the ta performing a task in the pipeline. So mm -hmm. data product developer, or let's say that data developer or data user even like simplify it further, is someone who is, for me, is a representative of future engineer, future developer that is applying um, evergreen software engineering practices such as testing and versioning all, all these practices that we learned by building software to build resilient and long-term um, digital products in this case data products and also works with data so their objective when they wake up in the morning is that how can i provide this state the, the great experience of the data in understandable, discoverable, you know, native mode to the data analysts, data users, data scientists, uh, and that's their job. So again, that's, I think, at the intersection of people that understand data well, and then people that are great developers. Uh, so we call them just data developers or um, data product developers, but their accountability lies within providing data as a product. They're the long-term, long-standing team providing a product that happens to be data. Very nice. I have one, only one more question because I, I'm also very keen to get to next data, but my, my question is a little bit of a issue that I'm having. Uh, my friend Tony Bear calls it data mesh washing. I see so many companies that they claim they're doing a data mesh, but they bend the principles as they see fit. Are you seeing that? And is there a way to avoid it? Uh, by any chance, by the way, I, I was going to ask you for data products, is there a certification? <laughs> <laughs> no certification. <laughs> no certification. No okay. certification. I won't be backing any certification. It's just because I have seen so many, um, I don't know, just making money, making certificates that go nowhere uh, in the past with agile movement and, and so on. So I'm not a fan of certification. Mm -hmm. However, Martin Fowler, right? Martin, Martin Fowler. Fowler. Yes, I've worked with, closely with Martin. Right. He's a dear coach and mentor of mine. And um, I think he, he has a few scars, let's say, from <laughs> the, you know putting a signature on the Agile Manifesto and then t seeing it turn into a a commercial engine um, and certification is one way of making money um, anyway so that aside I think uh, you're right I, I, I love this term actually data mesh washing I'm gonna, <laughs> I'm gonna steal that and use it um, mm. I think Sanjeev I think that's a isn't that just the natural process of mm. new ideas being adopted being diluted uh, because you know we we are just we are at a point that this is a this is an you know a future state, but we have to make it there, and it's hard. And usually, people want to, want shortcuts. They want overnight, mm -hmm. you know, transformation, and um, that can't happen. So you have to, if you want to, I don't know, promote yourself or show some progress, you have to do some data mesh washing, I suppose. Um, and I think part of it is uh, also lack of um, reference implementation of. A North Star uh, that hasn't existed because it data mesh came as a concept. Uh, I personally was involved with a lot of point solutions that we built in different contexts and customers, but there hasn't been really a, um, a manifestation or implementation of this idea as a reference architecture, reference implementation for people to kind of grasp it quickly by seeing it touching it you know the touching it at the fingertips on the keyboard and just really see how it comes to life 
so that they can work toward it. Um, if I, again, I use that analogy, like my experience with microservices, it came out the first time, I think one of the very first popular publications was again from ThoughtWorks, Martin Fowler, James Lewis wrote, wrote this uh, blog post on what microservices are off the back of the work that the company was doing with their clients. And then shortly after that, and I remember the very first implementations were just service um, I guess microservice washing really I see. <laughs> uh, and then you know and then Netflix published uh, the, I think they were one of the early companies that published their OSS uh, frameworks and showed yeah. how they brought it to life and that became a North Star at the time for people so uh, there was no washing anymore because you could point to a real implementation uh, and yeah let's let's work toward that yeah. so we don't need yes, to I'm talking about North Star is a perfect uh a segue into next data because I, I believe that's what you're attempting to do. So I will start with why. What benefits can customers expect from next data? Yes. So uh, why there is technology today that we can use and bend it to integrate it into this new topology? Those efforts are costly, expensive, ineffective, and full of compromises. I mean, I, I did that, right? I did that for a few years, and I'm very excited about what vendors you know, have done in terms of embracing the concept and figuring out, okay, how can I extend what I have today, not pivot, mm -hmm. how can I extend what I have today with a solution that can help people a little bit uh, move them toward data mesh, right? Um, but nevertheless, most of the technologies we work today were built for a paradigm of data pipelining, data movement toward lake warehouse, and then data governance after the fact, yeah. either as an exploration and extracting what's meaningful or as a manual tagging and stamping yeah. and, and, and so on. So it's a very pipeline left to the right model. And the problem that I saw firsthand was um, integration of these technologies into this new mode is very expensive, very ineffective. And I have <laughs> millions and millions of dollars to, to kind of show how much it actually takes for it to, to build that North Star with existing technology. And secondly, we want to, uh, what we aspire to do is that if we want to sh you know, shape the behavior of people, teams, so that their ultimate focus is delivering value. And delivering value is through these self-contained, autonomous, domain-oriented data products. And if we want to do that, we need a new primitive to work with. So data products should be the primitive that we work with. And our tooling should manage that life cycle and help the data producers on one hand and data consumers on the other hand directly a build, share, connect, and discover and use data product. When I talk to a lot of leaders that are, in fact, trying to lead data mesh, when they talk to me, they say, when I ask them, okay, what, what does your you know, data world looks like? They tell me, I have thousands of data pipelines. And they say that almost with a pride, right? We have thousands of data pipelines. Well, data pipelines, don't deliver value. They move and transform. They're yeah. a piece of a puzzle, right? Very so high to, cost and effort. Yeah. High cost. There's no level yeah. of abstraction. There's yeah there's experience is suboptimal. Right? Yeah. Absolutely. So so we want to change the narrative to I say, see. really, if everybody focuses on this basic primitive of data product that builds in out of the box the governance, that computational governance, that discoverability. You know the code and data together, so that that needs to come to come to exist, so that then we can build an ecosystem around it, right? Right. So we we try to build that basic foundational piece to bring this to life. So can you talk more about like what products? I, I've noticed you have something on your website called Next Data Operating System. So what are the products that Next Data is going to build? Yeah, so we, I mean, it's too early to really to say exactly what the product shape would be, but one of the early technologies that we will be introducing is this idea of a basically um, like an operating system that you run on many different hardware, I suppose, like an operating system, you run it on different um, data 
technology that exists today. You run it on Daybreaks or you run it on Snowflake. You you tap into whatever storage and computation compute systems that you have, data compute and data storage. However, uh, like an operating system, uh, creates a new developer experience for building and sharing and connecting on one end and discovering and using data products. Uh, so it's really a data product centric developer experience I set see. of technologies um, to empower teams, to empower domain teams. At the end of the day, we want to make it really easy so that domain teams can take the ownership of data as a product. While data governance team and you know people that care about the compliance and security can sleep at night because yeah. the data products are never built without compliance and um, security built in. So it's interesting. So uh, you mentioned like to share data, make it reliable, accessible. Uh, I want to go into that, but what I'm understanding is that Next Data OS sort of decouples the technology layer, like a data warehouse or a lake house, and puts a focus on data. So if I'm a business person, instead of me learning about primary keys, foreign keys, it's abstracting that. Uh, is that yes so we absolutely i mean we want to change the narrative from a data file data table to a semantic model of a data that has some code that's generating data based on that semantic it has some policies that govern that data mm -hmm. and it has some you know metrics that make that data tr discoverable trustworthy so we want to really change that narrative from again, tables or files or streams to data products. So um, that needs a new set of tooling, right? A new developer and user tooling. Whether we, I don't think we want to completely abstract away um, yeah. the underlying technology. Perfect. It's gonna be porous, like people still probably use a Spark yeah. to write that code, but Correct. with a new experience. Yeah, so, so, so those people who are used to using SQL, Spark will still, can carry on, but Absolutely. other business people, for them, data product become like this first class primitive. Uh, yes, and people who write SQL and Spark, they can't just write SQL and Spark. That's kind of, for us, that's irresponsible. You write that within the context of a data product that you're generating. So then right. you can't just write a Spark job. What you're writing is probably a Spark job that performs some transformation. Right. to produce the data product as part of an implementation of a data product. And you have to do a little bit more. You have to think about the model of your data semantically, and you have to think about what guarantees this data have. And then- um, The whole SLA. Yeah. Exactly, yeah. SLAs and policies. You don't have to right. worry about implementation details because we, we're gonna right. make that really, really easy, but you've got to take a moment and mm -hmm. think about what's the purpose of this job? What's the product that I'm trying to maintain? Yeah. Uh, but yet we meet you where you are. We meet you um, in terms of the tools that you like to use. We 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 don't want to replace we replace those. Correct. And uh, Jamal, I've also seen on your website you talk about containers. What's the connection between containers and data products? Next data OS. Yeah, this uh, new I guess primitive of data product. Um, mm -hmm. It has more than just files or tables. It has more than just data in it. It has other components. We talk about policy, we talk about code, we talk about logs, metrics, logs, right? So it has other components. So for it to be an autonomously and independently packaged, hmm. independently run, independently discovered, yeah. we see our mental model is very much like, a, I guess, operational world, is that you need a containerization system. Yeah. Uh, to be portable, even today, maybe you run it on software like tomorrow on Databricks, the next day, some other, you know, technology that's on the horizon. So we want it to be as portable as possible and self-contained as possible at build time and at runtime and at access time. So for us, that's such a fundamental construct that we want to create and we will absolutely open source that. Um, oh, wow. Hopefully it will become a de facto. If we do a good job, Hopefully, it will become a de facto standard for others to use. Yeah, I mean, this is so exciting because then we can take that data product and we can run it in a cloud of our choice on-prem, I'm guessing. 
So that's the dream. I mean, it's not going to be overnight, of course, yeah. but uh, <laughs> by defining, you know, similarly like an operating system, right? You build a driver interface and then a lot of different companies contribute to the driver implementations mm -hmm. so that you can print to many different types of printers. So it's mm -hmm. the same story. Uh, we, we are very uh, careful with our interface design so that we can apps create ways of adapting this to many different platforms and you know move your container around mm -hmm. over time. Very interesting. I want to uh, drill down uh, a little bit deeper into, you said making it easy to share uh, data in a reliable way. We we know how much, how important data sharing has been in the last couple of years as Snowflake and Databricks and everybody has a data sharing exchange uh, kind of a technology. What is the, what is the next data's role in let's say data sharing? Yes. So with uh, when we we don't say data sharing, we say data product sharing. Yeah. So okay. our role would be what are those high defining those higher level APIs for discovering, learning, understanding, and then accessing a data product and using the data that it offers, right? So we in that data product sharing, um, we have an opinion and approach to. Um, the APIs that let you discover them. And these APIs are very much bottom up, as in the, the, the uh, capability and the information needed for the discoverability and use is provided independently by each data product. So it's not top down. But when you finally get access to discover it and use it and understand and get to the data, today, our very first implementation is going to rely on accessing data in the underlying platform, whether it's through the Delta sharing or other modes of API sharing. That's today's implementation. But if you think about this really powerful notion of abstraction for data products, you can imagine that in future, the shape of those data sharing part of this data product sharing API could evolve to be more computational, to bring the computation to the data as opposed to just move data around somewhere else to get compute, compute get computed. But that's further on the roadmap as uh, and not now. I see. Uh, one more question I have uh, while we're talking about the products. And, and I know, uh, thank you so much for, for going into all this detail so early in your journey. But um, just trying to clarify in my mind, you know, we've got uh, all of these ma uh, metadata management products that uh, we talk about, data catalogs, data quality, data observability, and data ops. Can you talk about like, what is the overlap with next data and some of these? Sure. Uh, uh, yes, yeah, so um, you see the the what they're trying to achieve. Let's let's pick data catalog as an example, right? Mm -hmm. Data catalog tries to provide some sense of a visibility to the state of the data at scale in an organization to allow individual groups like the data governance to then govern that data, to tag it, to validate it, to enrich it with more information. That need for data visibility, data discovery, data governance remain to exist. The approach to do it um, will change because right now data cannot is not is indefensible, cannot protect itself. The moment you put it on the disk, it's a stale. Nobody's governing it. Like as in, you know, in itself doesn't have any sense of urgency. So then what happens is after you generated the data, somebody later in the process needs to come and say, oh, I found these data files. I think this is when they were generated. I think these are the people who are using it. And then layer on top of it, some level of trust and, and governance and the, the, the catalogs today do that. So with data, I guess with next data, we, we remain to have those needs. How we expose information, those the metadata and policy that, that becomes very different, becomes bottom up instead of a top down. Uh, so every data product, perhaps catalogs will evolve to now allow data products to mm. be registered dynamically. So the nature of the catalog becomes more dynamic, more intentional and bottom up and 
the information provided left in the life cycle of a data as opposed to right. Uh, so I think they remain to exist, but they just reshape to and, and hopefully their job becomes much, much easier, to be honest. So they become kind of the consumers or this data product catalog where you are exposing the, the metrics, uh, data quality, usage, lineage, observability information. Is, is that the idea? Absolutely. Every data product will be intentionally built in, provide this information at every point of its life cycle. And because we're de defining that containerization, we're defining the engine, the, the kernel of that, that operating system that's running within those data products, then um, there is a sense of trust and reliability because it's built in yeah. by the data product developers and the catalog becomes a view, essentially a view and a search system. Got it. So you can search and browse data products. And so you're bringing some sort of like a cohesiveness to these pipelines. Absolutely. So who are your ideal customers as you embark upon this journey? Yes, yeah, so we are, um, in fact, right now, pilots have pilot programs running with our ideal customers at this point in time. Um, our ideal customers are data mesh adopters. They're lead, lead adopters of data mesh. Um, they already had pain points that data mesh tried to solve. They have attempted it. They probably have some implementation, but they reach some limits. Um, I know that folks have really have done an amazing job in multiple organizations that I know, but they they kind of reached the limits in terms of, okay, we build some form of a metadata representation of data product, but now we need to do the governance. Now we need to do cross-platform data sharing. So they've mm -hmm. reached those pain points. Um, they're naturally larger organizations. They have that inherent complexity of many domains, many moving parts. They're data forward. They have pretty aspirational um, strategies around how they want to use the data that are not just confined to BI and metrics and dashboards. Um, and, you know, they are, uh, they, 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 they're willing to, to kind of, the courageous leader is willing to adopt a new technology. After all, we are, we are super, super early. Uh, so those, those are some of the characteristics of um, I customers. So Jamak, I, I, sorry, I'm asking you all these question, tough questions. You have a very young, literally, uh, very, very young uh, team. Uh, and uh, who are the key players in your company? Um, so, as you said, we are super early and very young team. Um, but I'm blessed with a few individuals that I dearly love and, and trust. And they're amazing people. I start with our CTO, um, Ragatha Murthy, and he was RSM, he goes by RSM. Um, he's been in the big data space for a really long time. And every time we say that, he says, you're giving my age away. Um, he's been at Yahoo. He has been, um, you know, implemented and contributed to Hive. He has been at Facebook. He was one of the core team members that um, scaled data platforms of Facebook from, you know, to, to the global scale. Um, he had his own data company called Data Coral that was acquired by um, uh, Cloudera, I, I believe, um, and he's joined us as the CTO. Uh, I also have Sina Jahan as the head of product. Sina and I were in trenches, early days of data mesh, and he has done an amazing job building uh, data mesh platforms for a lot of customers uh, and probably is one of the very very few people in the world that has seen data mesh implemented over and over over the last few years at ThoughtWorks. We worked together at ThoughtWorks. Uh, and um, Dan Siewicz, who is the principal engineer, um, an amazing an amazing engineer, very action-oriented, impatient to, to get building and shipping products out the door. So these are some of the very early um, founding. I see. Members. So talking about shipping, I have yes. a million dollar question. Again, I'm putting <laughs> you on the spot. When do we get to see the first product or even MVP? If I say any date, my team will kill <laughs> me literally after this call. So I'm not going <laughs> to say any dates. Okay. Um, 
but it would be let's say it would be months not years um be patient with us um if if people want to see the, the early versions of this or be involved in building the early versions reach out and um, be part of our design partners but for the i suppose markets we it will be months, not years, and we um, we would very much love to build in the open with some of the open source pieces. Um, so, uh, Jamark, if I'm not mistaken, you already have some paying pilot customers. Is that correct? Yes, we do. We do. We have this um, kind of um, pilot platform POCs uh, that implement a very very thin slice use case um, of data mesh. Let's say of a data mesh implementation in a sandbox pilot environment um, in the context of our customers supported by our platform. And they're really the purpose of those engagements are twofold. One is a really a beginning of a data mesh incubation in a way. They create um, both education around, okay, how do we do data mesh, contextualize using data mesh in their organizations, create alignments between the stakeholders and accelerate and, and facilitate a lot of technical challenges that they have in implementing data mesh through this pilot uh, platform that we provide. Often those fall into the category of data sharing across technology, data product, how to build data product the right way, discovery and governance. Right. So that's kind of the, if there are a few months uh, short engagements that we are running a few of them this year. Are you looking for any more partners, customers? Always, always, always. I think we want to be as close to the reality as possible mm -hmm. and build with and for our customers from very early on. So mm -hmm. uh, we still have a couple of spots left for our mm -hmm. perhaps paid POCs and quite a few slots left for our gen generally design partners. And I'm, and I'm very grateful. In fact, since the announcement came out, we've mm -hmm. got, I don't know what is it today, probably about 800 um, submissions of, early um, access or, or or demands to see a demo um, or be a part of a design partner. So I'm utterly, utterly grateful for the, for the market response. How are these submissions coming? What is the email address? Or what? Where should the people go? Sure. If they go to uh, nextdata.com, they mm -hmm. will see probably two ways to get to us or um, either click the get early access or email us at hello at nextdata.com. And I will personally answer their emails. Oh, very nice. <laughs> I'll be very busy in the next few days. You will be very busy. I know, yes, you have huge, huge uh, commitments. In fact, I want to change tracks. We have a few minutes left. I want to talk about some personal stuff, your leadership. The first uh, question that comes to my mind is that, you, you know, we are in this economic downturn and it has hit the tech sector the most. How does this play into your desire to start this company at this time of uh, life? Yes. Well, I've been told by our investors that some of the best companies were formed and created in the yep. downturn because you have to be frugal. You have to be very focused on delivering value and getting to the market. And those are fantastic forcing functions uh, mm -hmm. that we welcome. Uh, I think from a startup at, at our stage, uh, talent acquisition is is somewhat easier um, mm -hmm. in, in terms of, you know, the, we have seen with the layoffs and so on. Uh, and there is a portion of that talent that, of course, they are just not suitable for a startup life. They're not necessarily risk takers. They like to have a, you know, good salary in a big company and they're generally not our target audience in terms of talent and they they are even more risk reverse uh, risk averse in this situation so i don't think we would have ever they would have ever fit this lifestyle and now it's even harder to get them uh in terms of the funding of course uh vcs are uh, very careful there's a lot of i, I hear that there is still uh, funding available but the very careful who will get that finding. So, and I'm um, very, I guess, optimistic yeah. uh, in terms of our uh, our position because we have traction in the market. We already see we have pain customers that um, they have the pain points we are poised to solve. You know, I uh, I read this piece of news just recently. LPs have three hundred billion dollars to invest 
They just don't know where to invest. And most of that investment, when it happens, is actually going in, uh, going into seed or early stage yes. because those are sort of smaller investments and the risk is, is contained and there's more chances of success than very late stage funding uh, for companies. So, so this is actually a great time. Yes, that's that's what we see as well. Very nice. How was your transition? You were an engineer, consultant, and now you're a founder. So how's that experience? Um, <laughs> I, it's, uh, I don't know how to describe it. It's uh, Well, as you said, I was actually early in my life as a graduate. I was in early stage startups, in fact, and then scale-ups and building deep tech products. So I guess I get went back to my roots in a way and where my heart always has been. Um, but this particular experience, it feels like Sanjeev, I was kind of walking along the stream for a while and then I wanted to just tip my toe in the water to see what it feels like. And it just <laughs> white water washed me away. Yes. <laughs> trying to stay <laughs> afloat right now. Uh, not a lot of sleep and um, yeah. as you can imagine, not, not a, a whole lot of personal life, but exhausted and never been more alive it's an amazing oh, amazing wow. experience i, I oh, we have to ask our german audience what the what the german word for this state of being is that you are utterly exhausted and never more alive germans have some of the best words schadenfreude you know so i'm sure they have a word for this so if any german listener has a word for the state your mark is in please let us know um very quickly what are some of your lessons learned? What like inspiring inspirations that uh, would you, would you like to share with the audience? Trust your gut. Trust your gut, mm -hmm. and don't let uh, I guess naysayer make you doubt yourself. Um, of course, I'm still at the beginning of this journey, so I can't really claim victory. And I got it, and we go home. <laughs> but <laughs> but I think uh, right from the beginning of data mesh, in fact. Uh, when I very first time I went to that O'Reilly conference in 2019 and publicly talked about it, I was somewhat uh, scared in a way that I might get um, criticized because this is a sacrilegious, like everybody's building data lake and I'm saying beyond the lake. And, uh, and, and then I got courage by the reception, the warm reception that the pain points were real and it, it just snowballed from there. And so that's what I would say. And, and there were people that would, you know, they asked me that maybe I shouldn't write about this or I shouldn't talk about this. And I, I just knew that something, somebody has to say something. I was seeing it and it was evident and it was truth, the, the truth that was happening on the ground. So trust your gut. Um, the thing that you would regret in life is uh, the thing that you never did, hmm. not the things that you did. So... Um, if it's something that you want to do and you've been pondering and procrastinating, just, just jump in, just tip your toe in the water. And if it's meant to be, you get washed away. <laughs> yeah, no, I, I, great, great advice, you know, just, you know, follow your calling and, and then don't worry about the results, just, you know, results will happen, but, you know, follow your calling. Uh, Jamal, it's been absolutely amazing listening to you. I have one last question I'd like to ask my guests. Tell us something about you that the world generally does not know. Um, well, I don't know if the world knows, but I'm um, Iranian Australian, I guess Iranian by birth and Australian by immigration and citizenship. Um, and perhaps I could just like use this moment and bring the attention of your audience to what's happening in Iran or has been happening in Iran for the last few months mm -hmm. that, you know, there is a revolution yet led by women, very brave and courageous women and youth in Iran uh, who were named actually heroes of the year on Times magazine in 2022. And they were fighting for their freedom with nothing but their lives. And they are being brutally executed and suppressed. So um, if I could leave with a little ask, it would be that um, people to pay attention and acknowledge um, that situation, even with something as simple as a tweet, as a message, because every little tweet, every little acknowledgement, every little voice that 
people in that country, those really brave youth um, here, it gives them hope that they're not alone and, and people of the world are watching. So uh, maybe people didn't know about that. That's close to my heart. And yes, that's that's where I come from. Yeah, very, very well said. Also close to my heart, because as we've discussed, I grew up uh, as a child in Iran. And so I have a lot of affinity for people there and, you know, and the culture. So thank you so much for joining. It was such an immense pleasure. Wishing you amazing success. Thank you, Sanjeev. Thank you for the great questions and the conversation. Thank you. See you, everyone, next time.